I remember my grandfather, he died when he was 103. He lived, he caught three centuries. He was born in 1898, so he caught two years from 19th century, and he died in 2001, so he caught one year from 21st century. So he caught three centuries. And my grandfather, when he was in the war, for instance, he, he went in both wars, first and second. Both times he was taken prisoner, both times condemned to death, both times he escaped. One time in Siberia, one time in Germany. From Russia and Germany he escaped and he walked back home from Siberia. It took him six months to get back home. And he would tell us stories. And one of them, among many that I remember, one of them, they were in tranches, or however you call them. And he was always praying that he would never kill anybody, just help people. And he would see enemy soldiers wounded, and he would go and pray with them. And the Holy Spirit told him, don't move, stay here. And the lieutenant commanded them to back off, because the Germans were too close. You all need to move to the previous tranche or however you call it. Uh, he, told me, he told them, God told me that nobody should move. If you stay here, you'll be saved. And the lieutenant said, you are absolutely crazy. Look, we can see the tanks already. They are going to roll over us. They all moved back. He didn't move. A projectile fell on them and killed them all except him. And when he would tell us stories, I would ask him, how can you talk to God? And he would say to me, son, you don't know God. And I said, I know everything you should know about God. And he would say, yeah, you know everything all right. You just don't know God. <laughs> you understand? It's easy to go to church. It's easy to go to church. It's easy to return tithe, hopefully. <laughs> It's easy to keep Sabbath, but it takes a little more than that. I remember one time the police, he told us, caught him giving Bibles to people. And they beat him and beat him in the street and beat him with the shoes, with the boots, in his stomach, in his mouth. They beat him until he was all broken, internal organs broken. He, he was in a bloodbath. And they left him there no, not breathing, and they thought he was dead. He was in coma several months in hospital. People found him, took him to hospital. When he woke up from coma, uh, my grandma told me that the whole church was praying. And because there were nine children, people in the church started to plan who takes the children, who takes one, who takes two. And when he woke up from the coma, first thing he did, he started to sing that God gave him the privilege to suffer for God. And he said, if God gave me more days, I'm going to give more Bibles and more Bible studies. And he went back to give Bible studies. So I asked him, why do you do that? And he took me on his lap. He was working. He was, he was a carpenter. And I remember he had a, a, I don't know how you call it in English, but it's a wheel that you can sharpen knives on. And he had a, there was no engine, no motor. He, he had a pedal. And he would do that and the wheel would turn and he would sharpen his knives and then keep working in the wood. And he stopped, he sat down, he took me on his lap. And he said, son, and that was, that was a moment when he would start to son, we knew that there is no joke. And he said to me, what do you think about from morning to night? What is in your mind? And I said, everything. He said, that's the difference. In my mind is only one thing. You follow me? What is in your mind from morning to night? He said, in my mind is only one thing. He would sing all day. I've never in my life, until he died, never heard him quiet. Whistle or sing from morning to night, continually, 24-7, it would drive you crazy. Always second coming songs. And I asked him, why do you sing all the time? And he said, because I talk to Jesus. And that makes me sing. And I said, yeah, we talk to Jesus too. He said, no, you don't. If you did, you would sing too. <laughs> <laughs> we think we know God. 
That man spent days and nights in prayer continually. He was working and praying. I want you to think about this. <clears throat> the disciples walked with God three years and a half. I mean, they cannot be closer than that. They walked with God. They ate with God. Okay? They spent time with the Creator, eating together, sleeping together, walking together, working together. And they still had no power. No power to attract their children to Jesus, no power to save others, no power to heal the sick, no power to deliver the demon possessed, no power to resurrect the dead, no power, basically no power. No baptisms, no nothing. Until the upper room. Am I right? What happened in the upper room? Think about this. Moses, when the Amalekites attacked Israel from behind in the wilderness, what God told him, go on the mountain and pray. And, and Aaron and Hor were uh, holding his hands, supporting him in prayer. So I want to go a little into the subject. Uh, my grandfather would say to me, unless you make the goal of your life, not your stress, not your business, not your job, not your bills, not your health, not your family, not yourself, unless you forget all of that and make the goal to know God, you are never a Christian. You go to church, but you lose your time. When he comes, he's going to say, I don't know you. Those are terrible words. He would say, you are not a Christian. You should stop going to church. You just misrepresent God by going to church. You are not a Christian unless all of that disappears and you have just one goal. So let me, let me uh, go a little into the subject. When we moved from Romania to the U.S., we closed our business, got into ministry, and then we left Romania came to America. We didn't want to come to America, not because America is not beautiful. America is wonderful. We didn't come to come to America because we didn't know English. We didn't know anybody here. It was just changing your life. And who wants to change, you know, life? It's just it's not comfortable. And we are not poor, you know. We, we, we had what we needed. And so we gave up everything. And that's not easy. And my wife, sometimes she just says, okay, you know. For me, I like my car, I like, my, I like my things, I always want to have some things, you know. For me, I feel comfortable, I have my tools, and nobody should touch my tools. You touch my tools, you are in trouble, you know. Anyway, you know what I am talking about, I see you moving your head. Yeah, <laughs> I should pray for you too. <laughs> anyway, so we moved, when we got here, do you think it's easy to surrender? It's not easy. When we got here, we had no insurance, no work permit, no money, no job, no English. Imagine, people were just offending us, hurting us, because they would talk to us, and because we didn't understand, they would come close, talk in my mouth, and scream. As if they scream, I understand better English. You can scream as long as you want, I still don't get it. You know, they thought if they talk louder, then I'm going to instantly know English. Nonsense. That was offending. And I thought that I was educated, I was somebody, and instantly I was nobody. Because you go in a different country, you are nobody. Among so many thousands of students in Southern Adventure, I don't know how many, I have no clue, it doesn't matter. So many students there, I was nobody. And they all had cars. I didn't have a car. I had the car of the apostles, you know, walking. Uh, yeah, I would walk to, to, to school and walk to church and when we wanted to go grocery shopping, we would go to the closest store because we would walk, you know. It was crazy. And so, in that situation, you wonder why God doesn't do miracles for you when you pray. Because you don't need a miracle. Pretty simple. Because God did miracles for us because we needed a miracle to, every day. It was necessary to survive. You know, so we prayed quite a lot. The less you have, the more you depend on God. The more you pray. 
And sometimes God has to allow some things to teach us depend on him. And we don't like that. Am I right? We don't like that. I mean, I have a hard time to give up a small thing. We say, oh, I love Jesus. I'm happy to give my life. Mm -mm, That's not real. That's not real. Quick story in the story, um, a parenthesis. We, when I was in Andrews, I got our first car. It was not our, it was our second car in America. Anyway, it was a junk a Dodge Grand Caravan. You probably have heard the story on the internet. That junk, that junk, I got it in the, in the, in the, in, in the um, auction. And my friend that went with me to the auction said, don't buy it. I said, hey, it's cheap. I don't have 15,000. This is only 2,500. I can buy it. And it has TV. In 1998, to have a TV in the car was something. Right now, it's nothing. But in that time, back then, you know, it has TV. He said, it's a junk. Why don't you think it's so cheap? Don't buy the car. I said, I want it. I like it. I got the car. The car broke within weeks. The transmission broke. It got stuck in second gear. It would not change. It was... Uh, 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 uh. It would not change to the uh, uh, third, you know, and fourth and fifth. It would not switch. And I was driving on the interstate, and I was like, uh, uh, driving slow, and all the cars passing by, and some of them blowing the horn and showing me signs, bad signs, you know, with the fingers and screaming to move off the road. And it was just terrible. And I remember... I stopped the car, prayed over the car, nothing happened. I prayed more for resurrection, nothing happened. I started again, nothing happened, still stuck in the second gear. And so I had no choice. I went to the junkyard, purchased the transmission because a new one was $3,000 and the whole car was $2,500, you know. I got a second-hand transmission, $500, I paid the mechanic that was one of my elders, 450 altogether 950 replaced the transmission, in two weeks it broke again. Oh, I hated the car from the heart. I went back to the junkyard, purchased another transmission, spent another 500 another 450 paid the elder to install it, another 950 altogether, and then I said, I'm not going to drive it, I'm going to sell it, let somebody else have it. I put it for sale, nobody called. I put it to 4000 to recover my money that I spent on transmissions. Nobody called. I dropped the price and dropped the price, put it on Craigslist, put it on Amazon, put it in front of the mall, in front of Walmart, big paper in the window, luxury van with TV inside. Nobody cared. Nobody called. Eventually, we talk about surrender. I go to church and I tell my church, if there is something in your life that you cannot surrender, you have doubts, it's hard to give it up. That's your God. Whatever you don't give up, that's what you worship. You may think you worship God, you actually worship the beast. And so after I told the church, I get in the van, Lord, please help me sell this junk. Please help me sell the van. Please help me sell the van. And God said to me, do you love me? I said, yes, Jesus. Are you ready to give me the van? I said, you can have it. It's not Mercedes. You know, it's a junk. You can have it. And God said, do you surrender everything? I said, yes. Give me the van. And I said, how much do you pay for it? (laughs) Because I need money to buy another car. The story is long. I'm not going to go through the story. Basically, God didn't talk to me anymore. God stopped talking. And I felt terrible because I said, I love you with my whole heart. But I am unable to surrender my car. Unable to surrender, even if God would ask for my bank account, it was almost empty. Still unable to surrender it. If God would ask for my house, I lived in a small apartment. It was everything in one room, the kitchen, the bathroom, everything, you know, crazy. Yet unable to surrender it. We just have a hard time to surrender. Moreover, when it's about control in our life, we do things the way we do things. We don't give up. We like to control. So God said to me, you say you love me, but you cannot surrender a van. How do you think you are going to surrender everything else? So I said, Lord, I give you the van. You can have it. And in that moment, a lady called, and one of my members, and she said, Pastor, I want to buy the van. 
I said, I'm not going to sell it to you. You'll hate me. You'll never come to church again. <laughs> and, and she says, my brother fixed it for you. I know it's a junk. That's the reason I want to buy it. I cannot afford to buy a $30,000 van. All I have is 2500 I said, why would you want, if you know it's a junk, why do you want to buy it? You talked about surrendering. All I have is 2500 God impressed me to surrender all. And I want to drive people to our church every Sabbath. I want to use the van to drive people to church. So I'm going to surrender all I have left over. Her husband left her. She was poor. She says, all I have is 2500 I'm going to surrender it. So I said, hey, take it. 10, 15 years later, I was in Kentucky, moved from Wisconsin. I met her. I said, how are you doing? Good, you're good. And she said, you know, I'm still driving the van. (laughs) I hated the van. I mean, why did it break twice in a few weeks? And she's driving for 10, 15 years. And I said, why does it keep running? And she said, because I surrender it every morning. You know, (laughs) whatever you keep, you lose. It's cursed. Whatever you give to God, God is blessed, you know. But that's not the subject. The point is that we don't surrender. And going back, I was in Southern. We had no money. We had nothing. And I was walking to school. You remember the first story? We are going back to that story. I was walking to school. And I was sick. And I had allergy. And I had spots on my body from head to toes. All red all itching, all burning. And I went to doctors in Atlanta, Georgia. I went to doctors in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And they said, nothing we can do. It's stress. And they gave me a bunch of prednisone and they gave me a bunch of things. Nothing worked. And I was not sleeping in the night because of the itching, of the allergy. And in the morning, I would go to school without any sleep. And in the school, I would not understand a word from their teaching. And I was going back, walking and crying because it didn't make any sense. Why would God want us in this country when we didn't want to come? I was hating the country and hating English and hating everything around me. And I was just, why here? Why, when I had a good life, why would you ruin my life and destroy my life? I was actually fighting God. Did it ever happen to you? Why would you destroy my life? I had a life. And I was crying and not sleeping until one night when God said, you'll not not get anywhere before you really give up your life. And that night I was ready to die. I was in so much pain. I cried the whole night. It was around 5 a.m. When I got on my knees and I said, you know, I surrender my life. Do what? If you want me to die, I die. I'm okay with it. And um, next day I was walking to school. And I stopped in the garden of prayer and I was crying against a trunk that was in the garden of prayer in front of the seminary. And there was background music and as I I put my head against that trunk, the tree trunk, and I started to cry and saying, Lord, I surrender my life. I surrender my family. I surrender my future. Do whatever you want. Your plan. I am okay to live or to die. And God spoke in my mind, it's not enough. I said, what else? (laughs) He said, I want you to surrender every day the same. I will never lead you before you surrender every day. Any day that you don't surrender, I cannot lead you. Did you hear that? And then I said that surrender is a lifelong daily process. Lifelong daily process. I have the quotation in our presentation if we get there. It's a lifelong daily process. So I said, Lord, I surrender. I'm going to do it again tomorrow. And as I was praying, the dean in that time of the religion department, he came and I'm not going to go to the rest of the story. He, Young man, why are you crying? And I got straight, cleaned my eyes, and I put my hands like this. I said, I never cry. <laughs> I said, oh, you cry. You have tears in your eyes. I said, nah, that's allergy. I don't cry. I am okay. (laughs) And he said, you are too proud to acknowledge. He was right. (laughs) Because I was extremely proud and stubborn. And uh, I kind of thought about it. You are too proud to acknowledge. 
I'm going to jump over the rest of the story. We finished school. God worked a miracle every day because we needed one every day. And I remember I finished school and every morning my wife and I would get together and every evening would get together, get the children with us. And we would kneel down together and we would pray and say, Lord, again today we surrender our life. We want today to be fully controlled by your spirit. I don't know what's going to happen today, but I do know that I want to be controlled by you. So please do whatever you want. I give you permission if you want me to leave or die, to give up school. If you want me to lose school, I'm happy to lose school. Whatever you want, I am okay with it. But I got to get to the point that I was totally broken because I was not willing to surrender, not a bit. We surrender only what we are comfortable to surrender. We don't surrender all. We just sing it. I surrender all. Satan can sing the song too. He can sing beautiful. Satan has a nice voice. It's not what you sing or say. It's what you do. You, f- you hear me? And so, God has to broke me for me to accept to surrender. And I still have time every day to surrender. I have things when I argue because I just don't want to give up. But anyway, going back, finished school. In one year, finished 27 credits first semester, 22 second semester, 17 summer, finished my bachelor in one year by God's grace. And then I had to move to Andrews. And the school called and said, you need to get out of the apartment because next week, the classes start and the new students come in. You need to move out. But we didn't have an apartment in Andrews. We didn't have a place to move. So I called Andrews. And they said he's going to wait six months. You need to wait six months to get an apartment. We don't have an apartment for you. What do I do? Because school in Andrews started in, in a week or so. What do you do? You know, I didn't have an, We didn't have an apartment. So we prayed again, Lord, if you want us to go to Andrews, you provide. If not, we go wherever. And God never tells you where you go next. I hate that. He just doesn't tell you tomorrow. He will tell you today. That's it. You know? And so you need to live by faith. You need to know him enough from the past to trust him in the present. You follow me? And so what we did, what we did, we prayed and the school told us, get out. So as we prayed, Mr. that my wife was taking care of his father, said, why don't you move in my house for a week until you go to Andrews? So we put our stuff in his house. We didn't have much stuff. We got it all from Samaritan Center, from the community center. It was all junk. But nevertheless, you know, we had a bunch of books, a bunch of boxes of books, at least that, you know. And so we moved our stuff in his garage and we lived in his house. And he got a phone call from a guy. He said, I'm coming from Florida. I go to Andrews. Uh, I, drive fro- I drive an 18-wheeler. Florida Conference paid me to move two pastors that go to Andrews. I'm going to stop by to drop a round table. Your aunt sent a table for you. So I said to the driver, do you have room to put some stuff to move a young Romanian family? I was young in that time, imagine. Anyway, I was 32. Yeah. Do you have room to move a young family? He said, nope. I already filled half of my truck with the stuff from a pastor, and now I'm going to fill the other half with the stuff from the second pastor. No room. Okay. Seven, eight hours later, it was rain, heavy rain. It was pouring. It was like heaven was falling down, like, like the fire hose. Shh, heavy rain. The truck driver stopped by the curb in front of his house. And on that drive, Pearson Drive, uh, from the curb to the house, there is a little grass, you know, it's kind of far. And from the house to the garage, it, it's even more. And we had our stuff far, far away at the end of the driveway. Anyway, the driver stopped the truck in rain. and He came running with something on his head with a little round table. He put it under the porch and then he says, bye. And uh, says, what can I do with these kids? How do I move them? He said, oh, the second pastor changed his mind. He doesn't go to Andrews. Half of my truck is empty. 
But he said, I'm not going to wait until the rain stops. I have to be in Andrews tomorrow morning. I'm not going to wait until the rain stops. So my wife and I got in the street, right in the street, in the rain. We kneeled down and we said, Lord, if you want us to move, you can stop the rain. And in that second, the rain stopped. So, Mr. Across the Street, he was a short, retired pastor like Danny DeVito, really short, I mean, really short guy. Mr. Mr. was in the garage with the door open. Next to him, a white house, very small house. Mrs. She was a retired English teacher. And probably we should erase the names. Anyway, the retired English teacher. And they were watching and first they said, Pavel, don't you move your books in the rain. You are going to ruin them. If they get wet, you ruin them. Don't you move your books. We kneeled down. The rain stopped. We loaded in one hour, one hour something, all our stuff. We didn't have much stuff. In the moment when the truck driver closed the back door, in that fraction of a second, in a split of a second, when he closed the door, it started to rain. And Mr. the retired pastor started to behave in a different way that I see people doing usually. He started to dance a holy dance. He was like, wow, wow. <laughs> he was going in circles, you know. And I said, are you okay? <laughs> he said, I cannot help it. I've never seen, I all my life been a pastor. All, all my life I've been teaching people, baptizing people, but I've never seen this before. And I said, this is first time when I see something like that. The rain stopped and the rain started. That's unbelievable. When the rain stopped, I thought it just happened. But right now, I don't think that way anymore. Next day, by the way, the truck driver asked me, give me the address, your address in Andrews, where I am going to put your stuff. And I said, I don't have an address. And he said, what do you want me to do with your furniture and books? I said, I don't know yet. <laughs> he was like, are you kidding me? I said, no, I'm not kidding. He said, you better call me and give me an address because tomorrow morning when I go to Andrews, when I get there, I need to drop your stuff somewhere. So my wife and I prayed the whole night. And in the morning, we got a phone call from Andrews. A student from Africa left and we have an apartment for you. So I called the driver 30 minutes before he got there. And I gave him the, the address. The pastor went from house to house telling them the story. And I asked, why do you do that? And he said, I cannot help. Now I have seen it in my own eyes. I cannot help. So listen, folks. Classmates would ask me, good students, good people, friends of mine. Why would God do it for you and he doesn't do it for me? And I told them, very simple. You have a salary. You are sponsored by conference, so and so. Your parents give you money. Give me that money. Give me that salary and the sponsorship of the conference. The apartment is paid. The tuition is paid. The books are paid. The insurance is paid. Give it to me. And then God is going to do a miracle for you. <laughs> very simple. Do you want to have that type of trials in order to have that type of miracle? Because a miracle is a response to a need. You follow me? Because we all want miracles, but we, we don't want needs and trials. <laughs> Am I right? So going back, why aren't you like my grandpa, who was always singing and ready to be beaten or to die for Jesus? Why are you always singing? Why aren't you jumping and telling everybody the story? Why don't we do that? Why don't I see people here jumping? I'm not talking about going crazy, emotional, who, who you know, I'm, I'm not talking about that. Why aren't we excited? I mean it. I go to church and I hear people singing and it's like, mm, dead people singing. Why aren't we excited? My grandpa would sing from morning to night. I would ask him, why do you sing? He says, because... I talk to Jesus because I know I have Jesus. I said, I have Jesus too. He says, no, if you did, you would sing too. <laughs> you know about Jesus. You don't have Jesus. 
Why, if we have the best news in the universe, why aren't we excited? We really, folks, we really remember the women that went to the grave. And the angel said, come and see. We have not seen it yet. We have not experienced it yet. We talk about it. We know about it. But we have not experienced it yet. Because when you really encounter God's presence in your life, and that doesn't happen before you fully surrender, to the degree that you surrender, to that degree God can take over and transform you and then use you. God cannot work with something that he has no control over. What you control, God cannot control. Only what you surrender, God can work with. To the degree that you surrender, to that degree God can work. We have not yet surrendered. It's not comfortable. I would rather go to church and sing Kumbaya and eat tofu than to surrender. It's not easy to surrender. We don't like surrender. We hate surrender. The reason we have conflicts in families, in the church, is because we don't surrender. People that surrender, they just don't have an opinion anymore. They are flexible. Am I right? People that die to self don't fight because dead people don't fight. Dead people are dead. Paul says, I've been crucified. I no longer live. Jesus lives in me. He says, I die daily. In Galatians and in Colossians. So, if you die, if you surrender, there is going to be no more fights in the church, no more fights in the family. Dead people don't fight. If you fight, if you have opinions, arguments, it means you have never surrendered. You think you are a Christian? You are not. Go home. We misrepresent Christ to the world because we refuse to surrender. And we refuse to surrender because we still love self. And that's the bottom line. If you really love Jesus, you die to self. Without death, there is no life. Period. Jesus died, you need to die. And if you refuse to die, God has to take you, put you down, break you in order to save you. Am I right? And so going back, <laughs> going back, the disciples walked to Jesus, but they never had power because they always had their plans. Don't we have plans? I have plans. I have plans to buy a property, to build a house. If you see the property, I mean that. I am in the point. Today in the airport, I signed another paper. The bank sent me a paper. I signed it, sent it back. I have plans. But every day I go back and put my knee down and say, Lord, this is not for me. If I buy it for me, please stop it. If I can use it for you, then let me get it. I want to surrender it. I want to be a blessing. I don't want to be blessed. I want to bless. Unless you know that I will not be a blessing, unless, well, if you know that I will not be a blessing, don't let me get anything that is for me. How many times do you pray that you are blessed or helped? Am I right? Did it occur to you that the more you pray for a blessing, the less you get a blessing? God will never give you a blessing if you ask for a blessing. Only when you want to be a blessing, he'll give you a blessing. But going back, going back, I want you to think about this. Only when the disciples gave up everything, in the upper room. Only then God could work through them. And I want to go on that path because tomorrow we are going to go through the steps. How do you surrender? How do you unite in prayer? How does things get accomplished in the family and in the church? Really accomplished, really moving. Because people talk a lot about stuff, but they just don't do it. They just don't do it. It's easy to learn and to talk. But they are not doers. They are just talk talkers. And so, for instance, for instance, for instance, I was in Wisconsin many years ago, in 2000, when I finished Andrews. When I went to my church first time, there were, I don't know, 10 people in the church, 15. It was winter. In Wisconsin, that winter, it went down to minus 34. Can you imagine minus 34? 34 below? 
It was crazy cold. And I go to church. I remember one Sabbath, there were nine people. My family, four and another five. This is practical, real stuff, real life. In the church, all people were between 70 and 92. No offense, I respect elderly. I respect their wisdom. But when you have a church of five people that are 90, what, you know, there is not much hope. I'm sorry. Am I right? He's like, what am I going to do with you guys? Tomorrow you die. <laughs> and I said, what am I doing here? And I went home and I told my wife, I'm going to get out of ministry. This is depressing. And my wife said, you should. And I said, I thought you were going to encourage me. She says, get out of ministry. I said, why? She says, because you don't do what you preach. You just preach it. I said, what do you mean? You just told today that if we really get together and give up everything and give up self and pray together that God, we, we give up self, we die to self, we forget self, we don't even pray for self. I want you to remember in the book of Acts of the Apostles, page 50, 51, Helena says, when the disciples got together in the upper room, they did not ask a blessing for themselves, though they had needs. They, don't, they didn't even think about self. They surrender self. My grandpa would tell me, if you don't forget self, you still worship self. So my wife said, you should get out of ministry because you don't live what you preach. Oh, I don't like when she does that. She has a tendency to once in a while to do it, you know. And she said, you need to get them together. I said, who? The five dying ladies? And she said, yes. You need to get them together and pray together that God will resurrect the church. I said, he's dead. There is nothing to resurrect. And she shook her head and said, you should get out of ministry. And I knew that she was right. So I talked to the ladies. Do you want to pray? They said, yeah. And I said, in the morning. I said, when should we meet? And one of the ladies, 92 years old, she says, 5 a.m.? I said, no, maybe 9. <laughs> and the lady said, no, 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 pastor. We don't sleep too much in the night. When you get to our age, then she went on and on talking and shaking her head. And she said, Six, pastor? Is that okay with you? I said, okay, 6 a.m. You wake up minus 34 Fahrenheit at 5 to be at the church at 6. You get in the car and the car is frozen and you clean the windshield of ice and your hands freeze and you're like, Ugh, you know, and you hate that you have to get out. And you get in the car and you try to Basically, you freeze just by touching the steering wheel. And by the time you get to the church, finally the car starts to warm up, but you have to turn it off. And until you finish the prayer meeting, the car is cold again. It was not comfortable. But we, I got there, and the five ladies were there, waiting for me. And we prayed together. And I told them, we are not going to pray for ourselves. Pastor, but we have needs. I am sick. I said, yeah, you have been sick for a long time, I see. <laughs> and I said, we are going to find time when we pray for another. This time, the Bible says that when two or three pray together in one accord, you know what that means? Agreement. Ellen White explains. She says, unity of purpose. They pray for one thing. They unite. They forget everything else. They give up. They surrender. They give up everything else. And they all unite for one purpose. They say, Lord, we do have a bunch of needs. But we are going to give up all the other things. And we are going to pray for this. And she says that the disciples gave up everything else. And prayed for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. They prayed, she says, quote, for the promise. She calls the Holy Spirit the promise because Jesus promised to send the comforter, you remember? And she says, when we pray together in unity for one purpose, that unity, God answers. And the Bible says, when two or three pray in one accord, it will be given to them. So I told the ladies, I said, we are not going to pray for everything else. We are going to pray that God is going to resurrect this church. And we prayed for a month. Every morning, 
at six. Do you think it was comfortable in the winter in Wisconsin? It was not. I was hoping from the heart that after a month they say, okay, we did 30 days, enough. But you know, they said, no, pastor, can we pray another 30? And they said, why would you want to do that? And they said, since we started to pray, though we didn't pray for self, since we pray and plead for the church to be resurrected, our kids started to call us, our grandchildren started to call, and people started to come and visit us, and our family started to improve. So we really sense that since we pray, God is blessing, and we don't want to stop. And we kept praying together based on Jesus' promise. Very uncomfortable praying together every morning at 6. And after three months, the church had 120 or more people every Sabbath in attendance. And we didn't do evangelism, we didn't do Bible studies yet, we didn't. When we started evangelism, we baptized an average of 20, 30. In a church that used to have to be 20 members, you baptized 20, you know, it was like pff, doubling the church. You follow me? And the church kept growing and growing and growing and growing. Because we prayed together for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit over our church. Why don't you do that? Just honest answer. Because you, I'm, 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 I don't know you, you are wonderful people. I do know uh, Elder Jerry and Janet, I do know uh, Pastor Zach, I do know, I do know them, but I don't know you. You may be absolutely wonderful, godly people. But what stops you to get together and pray together for one purpose based on Jesus' word? Because Jesus says so. If two or three pray in one accord, it will be given. That's pretty plain, isn't it? It will be given. Why don't you do it? I was in a country, very advanced, very advanced country. And I met the pastors. And we had a whole like three-day seminar on outpouring of the Holy Spirit, latter rain. And then I asked them, why don't you do it? And one pastor said, do you want me to be honest? I said, yeah, should I expect you to be honest? And he said, I am afraid to do it. I said, afraid of what? He said, it's easy to go through the routines with the life that I already have. But when I do what you say, the whole life is going to change. God is going to get in and turn things in a direction that you don't even expect. Like Abraham, move out. Like Moses, go to Pharaoh. Like, you follow me? God is going to get in and turn things upside down. And he said, I'm not sure I am ready for that. You hear me? Because we don't like unexpected. We don't like unplanned. We don't like changes. We say we want to change. I hate change. When my wife wants to change something in the house, I argue with her. Leave it the way it is. It's good. Don't change the furniture. Don't change anything. Just don't touch it. Leave it, at, leave it alone. I hate change. We are afraid to pray because if we pray, God is going to intervene and do things that are outside our planning, outside normal. You follow me? And we are not ready for it. Because we still love our ways and our comfort, don't we? But listen, folks, Jesus is coming. Even if we are blind, it's hard not to see it. Jesus is coming. And if we don't do it now, we will never do it. And there is no more time to play religion. Either you are in all or you are out. There is no middle ground. You follow me? Religion is not that you go to church. It's so easy to go to church. In fact, it's pleasant. You feel good because you did the right thing. I went to church. We sang and we prayed and we listened to the sermon and then we eat potluck and then we go home. We feel wonderful. Religion is not that. Religion is when you fully surrender everything. Your life, your house, your money, your health, everything. You fully give it to God and you don't care what happens to you. I'm not saying that you should give your money. If you want to give it to me, great. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm not saying that. What I am saying is that we daily need to die to everything. 
literally. People call me and say, why would God do a miracle for you and not for me? And I, I avoid to talk because I don't want them to be offended. But my question would be, did you fully surrender today? Really surrendered? So God could do something? Or you just want something without surrendering? Are you ready to give up everything today? You follow me? Are you ready to lose everything today? Are you ready to lose your life today for Jesus? My father would tell me every day, son, I'm so happy to die for God. It would be a privilege. And eventually he did. <coughs> he says, God died for me. Every day I want to die for him. And that was not words. If you knew my father, you would know what I am saying. And so, going back, if you really want changes in your family, if you really want changes in relationship with your colleagues, neighbors, whatever, if you want changes in your church, there is no other way. Get together, forget everything else, and in full surrender, pray that the Holy Spirit to take totally over and do whatever He wants with you. Do whatever He wants with the church. Do whatever He wants with your life. Do whatever He wants with your house or your car or your money or your job or whatever with your family, your children, whatever. Lord, this is it. I give it to you. I remember <coughs> my wife and I talked and there was a need. I'm not going to tell you pre precisely where. There was a great need in a place that I was supposed to go in a mission trip. My wife and I talked, we said, how much do we have? And my, I said, let's give about 20%. I said, no, let's give it all. And my wife is ready to give me. People think that I am the giver one because I am the one who does the giving. But she does the deciding. <laughs> you follow me? And so I said, let's give 20. I said, 20%. 20 I said, no, let's give it all. I said, honey, we need to give something. And she looked at me, she shook her head. I said, Ananiah, huh? And Sapphira. <laughs> I said, come on! We love Jesus. He said, just write the check. <laughs> and I really, I kind of, I was hesitant. I did write it, but I was not happy about it. And she says to me, you just lost your blessing. I said, I gave it all. She says, no, you gave only 20%. I said, Dana, look to the check. She says, no, it's not what you wrote on the check. It's where your heart is. <laughs> she says, you gave only 20%. She says, I gave it all. You gave 20%. You follow me? We have hard time to surrender. I'm not talking about money. You, you hear me? We have hard time to surrender, folks. And so, <clears throat> going back. The disciples got in the upper room. What did they do there? The Bible says that they were afraid of the Pharisees. And then it says in the book of Acts of the Apostles that they got there to hide because they were afraid of the Pharisees. That's clear. Okay. What did they do there? The Bible says that they prayed. They were dedicated to prayer. Very simple. But the spirit of prophecy in the book of Acts of the Apostles says, listen carefully, that they reap Repented. <coughs> what did they repent of? What did they repent of? What did they do so bad to repent, the disciples? She says that they repented of all bickering. <coughs> that they repented that they didn't trust Jesus. <coughs> Excuse me. My voice is not so good. Listen. She says in this order, they humble themselves and acknowledge their total dependence. They understood that they could not do the work. So number one, they humble them. I want you to remember what I say. It's going to be a quiz at the end, okay? <laughs> they humble themselves. They repented. Number three, they, she says that they prayed together for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. They prayed I want you to think about the Bible verse that says that in the Old Testament. If my people who are called by my name would pray and turn around from their evil ways. What is that? In one word. Turn around. Repentance. And if they would 
see my face and pray, am I right? I would heal their country and answer their prayers. God promised. He promised. Why it doesn't happen? When the disciples humbled themselves, repented, and prayed for the Holy Spirit, God did it. That's the recipe. Get together. Humble yourself before the Lord. When we built a church in Romania, <clears throat> when the police came to arrest all of us, because it was against the law during communism, when the police came to arrest us, people were hiding under the new construction, under the balcony in the back. It was rain. People were hiding and praying. And as people were praying desperate that we would go to prison and we are going to be beaten and tortured and maybe killed and maybe lose our freedom for the rest of our lives, if you get arrested in North Korea or in Cuba, it's not pretty. You probably never go back home. They would put you in a concentration camp and beat you every day and torture you and you will never be free again. And death is easier than to be in that situation. So we all knew what is next? <clears throat> when they got under the balcony <clears throat> and they started to pray, they were praying, Lord, we don't want to go to prison. We don't want to be tortured. Lord, please protect us, Lord. And they were crying and crying and crying, afraid of going to prison. My father went to the gates, talked to the police. Open the gate. And my father said, nah, you don't have a warrant. Open the gate. Do you have a warrant? No. Then go, bye. I'm not going to open the gate before you have a warrant. My father came back and people were crying. My father said, what are you crying for? We don't want to go to prison. And my father said, you still love your lives? You still think about self and your freedom? What about God? What's going to happen to God's name in this city? And he said, he said, you need to repent. We need to surrender and we need to focus on God and we need to pray for God's honor and for God's work and forget self. That's another level because when people pray, people pray for self. In my prayer seminar, I listened six months worth of prayers and 92% of all prayers, 92% of the prayers that I heard, it was all about self. 92%. Anyway, my father said to them, let's focus on God. And I remember my father saying, God is not going to come among us before we humble ourselves and repent. God is not going to come and do a miracle for us before we humble ourselves and repent. And my father said to them, remember what Joshua said to the people. The Lord said, sanctify yourselves so tomorrow the Lord will do great things among you. You remember? Before Jericho, when Jesus showed himself to Joshua, when God showed himself as a soldier, said, sanctify yourselves for tomorrow the Lord is going to do great things among you. And my father said, if you want the Lord to do great things tomorrow, you need to sanctify yourselves. You, you follow me? How did they sanctify themselves? They would cleanse themselves physically and then they would solve any problem they had between them they would not go to the prayer before they solved the problems and then they would solve any problem they had with God. And then they were ready. So my father said, let's humble ourselves and let's solve any problem we have. So when there is no more problem unsolved, then we can ask God's presence. God is not going to come as long as there is sin among us. If he comes, we will all die. We need to make sure that we confess. We cannot be holy yet but we can ask forgiveness at least, he said. So he went to one of the elders. So he said, please forgive me. And the other guy, I remember him, kind of a big, big guy, you know, said, Brother Pavel, why? He says, my father said, well, at home my wife and I have criticized you pretty heavy. I said, well, then I need to ask forgiveness too because my wife and I have criticized you too because you have been the head elder for 40 years and I want you to be the head elder. <laughs> And they hugged each other and they asked forgiveness and they cried on each other's shoulder and they said, you know what? I don't care if I am the head elder. If I go to prison, what? how would it help me? Please forgive me. 
and they hug each other and soon enough another one asked another one and another one asked another one for forgiveness and there was some that I've never seen in my life the whole church hugging each other crying on each other's shoulder asking forgiveness kissing each other it was something that I've never seen so much unity in that church there were two families that they were fighting for two generations I mean the parents and the children were still fighting in that moment, they forgot the fight. They were hugging each other and asking forgiveness and praying. It was a sweet spirit. The police didn't come back. We finished the church. Long story. I'm not going to... You read the book if you want to hear the story. But the point is, they experienced major miracles after they got together and humbled themselves and repented and prayed together. The whole church got under that construction and the whole church, I remember, I was there. The, I was in fifth grade. The whole church, they were crying together, praying together, asking forgiveness one another. There was a different type of doing church. They are not singing Kumbaya and listening to the sermon. There is nothing wrong with the sermon, don't get me wrong. But they did something new. They solved the problems they had. There was nothing inside unconfessed. You follow me? We don't do that. Even big people in high responsibilities, we don't do that because we don't like to do that. To humble ourselves? Come on. Who likes to humble? You follow me? We don't do that. And my wife comes to me every once in a while and says, Honey, drop it. I have an argument with my son. She says, Drop it. I say, Why? I'm right. And she says, Yeah, but you are not humble. <laughs> You follow me? She says, drop it. You are not going to win. If you really humble yourself and confess your part, then you win. We don't do that. That church did something new. They humbled themselves. They confessed to one another. They started to pray together. When I remember when they started to pray together, there was a sense that we have never felt before. It was a sense that God came among us. We felt, literally, that God was there. I've never had that feeling before in the church in my life. I remember everybody after we prayed the whole night, we started to pray at 2 a.m., 2, 2, 2, 30, 3 a.m. when the police came to arrest us in the middle of the night. We started to pray. And around 5, 6 a.m., people were singing. But nobody said, let's close with song number two. two. Nobody said that. They prayed, they prayed, and then the instantly they started to sing, and they started to cry and sing again. It was something different. You get the meaning. Because people got in that position to be arrested. They knew they will all go to prison. In a communist country, you go to prison. It's not a pretty picture. They knew they all go to prison. They knew that's the end of their life. And they, in the beginning, out of fear, started to pray. But then they switched prayer from save my freedom to Lord, forgive me. If there is something between you and me, discover it so I can solve it. And then they went to one another, they humbled themselves, they confessed, they asked forgiveness. And then, after they solved the problems, there was no more tension between them, they started to pray together, Lord, and I remember my father praying, Lord, we are happy to die for you. I, in my mind, I was fifth grade, I said, are you crazy? M my father was praying, Lord, we are happy to die for you. It's not, we are happy to go to prison, it's not about us anymore. But what's going to happen to your name in this city that is communist, that people don't know you, if the church is demolished? Do whatever you want for the sake, for the sake of your name. Do something so the city would know that there is a God and the city would have a chance to be saved and to know you. And they no longer prayed for their freedom, no longer prayed for... They forgot that they will be arrested. And they prayed that God would do something so the city has a chance to know God. And they prayed that God would pour the Holy Spirit over the church and God would renew the church and make the church a light in the city. And as they prayed, I remember they started to sing. They started to... It totally it was a different way of praying. A different way, a different environment. We had a feeling that the Holy Spirit came there. We had a feeling that heaven was in the church. Have you ever had that feeling? 
The church started to grow. From a small group, we got to, I don't remember how many, 100, 150. We got to 270, close to 300. But the point is, the church started to feel that heaven is in the church. And people would come to that church and say, this is different. We can sense God here. When people come to the church, do they feel God here? And it's not going to happen, folks, before we get together and pray. And I am not talking about just get together, pray a little, from 6 to 6.30 and that's it. That's good too. I'm talking about total surrender, total humbleness. Life or death. You follow me? Why don't you do it? Don't hear what I say next. Either we are too comfortable not to say lazy, too comfortable to do it, or we just don't want to change. We like where we are. We know we should change, but we say not today, tomorrow. You follow me? And Jesus is coming and God is calling you and me. God is calling you. Don't wait for the church to experience revival. You are the church. The church is not the building, it's not the institution. The church is you. God is calling you to take this step. If you want things to happen, that's the way they happen. Very sad, we know it. We just don't do it. He says in Ezekiel, God talking to the prophet, my people listen to you as they listen to good music. But they don't do it. They are listeners, but not doers. God is calling us to do it. And the fact that you came here tonight, it tells me that you do care. Because if you didn't care, you would not be here. <laughs> You'd be home eating a pizza. The fact that you are here, it means that you care. And God doesn't expect 300 people to get together. Jesus says whenever two or three. Numbers don't impress God, though he, he wishes there were more. Commitment impresses God. You follow me? Because people call me and say, we, we are just about five. That's absolutely wonderful. God can work with five. God can do a miracle through five or through 500. Doesn't matter for him. The disciples got together in the upper room. Elena says they humbled themselves. They repented and they prayed. When they humbled themselves, she talks a lot about it. And I have the quotations. We don't have time tonight. We'll probably talk tomorrow. When they humbled themselves, she says they recognized that they cannot do it in their own power. Basically, the mission that God gave us is more than what we can do. How can you or me evangelize the world? If I would ask you, I mean all of you, how many are you here? I don't know. If I would ask you to evangelize the whole California, every city, every village, every street, every house, every, can you evangelize California? What if I would ask you to evangelize the U.S.? I mean, every city, starting with New York and Atlanta and Chicago, uh, L.A. and uh, small, big towns, doesn't matter. The whole U.S., can you, this group, do it? No. If I ask you to evangelize the whole world and Africa and Asia and Europe, and this is crazy, every town in the world. And that's what Jesus asked them, to, to go from Jerusalem to Judea to the end of the world. How could they? And she says they recognized that they could not do it. They had no money. They were persecuted. They had no media. They, 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 they had no way to do it. They were afraid to get out of the upper room. And they humbled us and said, we cannot do it. We need you. Number two, they repented of all bickering, all tension, all division. And then I said, by repenting, listen carefully now. She says, they prepared the way for the Holy Spirit to come. By repenting, they prepared the way. We need to repent of all divisions and all. We don't have to agree in everything. But we got to work together. Press together. You follow me? They repented of all divisions. You get in a board meeting and sometimes you feel like, man, are these Christians or something else? 
You follow me? I've been in those boards. And I would go home with stomach pain. And hate to go to another board meeting. Why? Because we are not born again. When we repent, we don't have to agree. But we love one another deeply. We respect one another deeply. We are ready to pray together for whatever we don't agree. We kneel down, we hug one another, and we say, let's pray about it. And let's let the Holy Spirit impress us. That's when we repent. You follow me? They, we need to repent and to, to, to pray together to the degree that there is no more division, no more tension, to the degree that the church is one. What Jesus prayed in John 17. In John 17, he says, I pray that... As the Father and the Son are one, imagine the unity within the Trinity. The unity between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. As we are one, so they, the church, may be one. That type of unity he wants in the church. When we unite, then we, when we humble ourselves, repent, unite, then we prepare the way for the Holy Spirit to come and do amazing things unbelievable, unheard of things. And God will do it. There is no question. The spirit of prophecy is pretty clear that the early rain was abundant. And she says, but the latter rain is going to be even more abundant. Even more. It's going to be powerful. It's going to happen under our eyes. The question is, you and me, are, I, are we going to be part of it or not? That's the question. And so, when we humble ourselves and repent and pray, it brings unity. When that happens, that repentance, that confession, that, con that prayer together, that unity, finally, it prepares the way for the Holy Spirit to come and take over. When the Holy Spirit comes, things go out of normal. Things go crazy. You know what I mean? Basically, things explode. And that's what we need. The reason we have nothing going on is because we are not there yet. The Holy Spirit cannot take over yet. And again, Jesus is coming. Do you believe that? Amen. Then why don't we get together and let's do this? You follow me? How many of you want to do that? Amen. Praise the Lord. Pastor, use it. Don't look for a miracle. People call me, we've been praying for a week, Pastor, and we didn't see a miracle. And I shake my head. And I tell them, I've been going to school for a week and they didn't even give me the degree yet. Don't look for a miracle. Don't look for a voice. Don't look for power. Don't look for something. When you get together and pray, do it because that's what God told you to do. And let him decide when you are ready and when he's going to do the miracle. You follow me? That's his job. Your job is to get together and pray and humble yourselves. Solve your problems. Pray together for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It's amazing. Jesus was pretty clear. If you who are evil give good gifts to your children, how much more, how much more your Father in heaven will give the Holy Spirit to those who? Get together and pray for the Holy Spirit. Basically, simple. Jesus promised that if you pray, God is going to give you the Holy Spirit. Ask for it. Ask for the Holy Spirit. You follow me? Very simple. Get together and pray. Not only, I remember I was... I don't remember how, 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 how small I was. But I remember I was in Romania and we had the 10 days of prayer. And my father talked to the pastor and said, we are not going to just pray as everybody prays. So they said, this is what we do. We start this Sabbath and finish the next Sabbath. This Sabbath, we all get to church and nobody goes home. And people took tents, people took, you know, he said, nobody goes home. And we are going to pray from Friday night to Saturday night, 24 hours together. And they took food. I remember looking in my mom's package, how much food left over. You know, because I eat. <laughs> and then during the week, we all prayed at home. And this is what we did. 
we would sign up. So it's, there are kind of 10 people at every hour. From 2 to 3 a.m., from 3 to 4, another 10 people, from 4 to 5, another 10 people, from 5 to 6, another 10 people. And I remember every morning at 3 a.m., it was my turn at home in our family. And I, would, I didn't want to wake up everybody. And at 3 a.m., I would go in the kitchen, and it was during communism, and they would turn off the heat and the electricity and the water. The government would turn it off. And it was cold. And I would put like five, six, six blankets on me and get the spirit of prophecy and the Bible. And I would go in the kitchen and cover myself because it was cold. And pray and study and pray and study for the Holy Spirit over our church or over our city. And I was small. I was maybe in second grade or third grade. And at 3 a.m., my sister came and I would go back to sleep. And you follow me? And we took turns, every family in the church, at every hour, day or night, through the week, somebody was praying for the Holy Spirit. And then next Saturday, we were together again from Friday night to Saturday night, the whole church praying. Do you think that's easy? It takes commitment. But that's how the church grew. That's how we experienced God's power in a communist country where they wanted to kill us. Yet, we built churches. That's how we experience God's power. We prayed. There is power in committed prayer. What if our churches in America all would pray that way? Can you imagine what God would do? Why don't we pray? We are too comfortable. So maybe God is going to allow persecution to wake us up. So we do what we don't want to do during comfort. You follow me? I remember when, I, when God asked me to surrender my van and I didn't want to, God said in my mind, do you love me? Yes. If you don't give it, I'm going to take it. I said, no, I would rather give it. <laughs> Sometimes God would have to allow some things to teach us to do what we otherwise don't do. And when we go through those things, we hate crisis, don't we? But those have a tendency to remind us to go back to God and to humble ourselves. You follow me? So folks, let's finish tonight. It's 8.30. I, I, I had a surgery on my vocal cords some time ago. Some time ago, I, it was like right before uh, Australia trip. Anyway, I had a surgery and the doctor told me not to talk more than 45 minutes. That's pretty hard. But <laughs> and um, <clears throat> I need to take a break for my vocal cords. But let's do something now because if we talk about prayer and we don't pray, it defeats the purpose. Let's do something now. Let's get together in family groups. Not 10, 20 people, just family. If you don't have the family with you, get with a friend or somebody together in small groups, two, three, but not ten, within family. And let's start now by confessing to one another. Can you do that? Do you mind to humble yourself and confess in your family and say, I'm sorry, please forgive me? Can you do that? It's hard? No? Good. Start with confession. Okay, humble yourself, repent, and then pray that the Holy Spirit would fill your family with, with, with his presence, would fill your children, with his, would fill your spouse, would fill the whole home with his, with his holy presence. Pray for the Holy Spirit to come, to prepare you, and to fill your heart and your family. Can you do that? And then, after you do that, pray that God would fill this church with the Holy Spirit. Let's finish tonight praying in groups and going that route first make sure that you say Lord I cannot change my life I cannot really surrender I hate to surrender I cannot do it in human power because I love self I cannot change our church I need you but Lord I ask your help and now I ask you to forgive me whatever I've done please cleanse me and then Turn toward the other one and say, please forgive me for this or that or whatever God would put in your heart. Don't hold it in. Okay? Spell it out. Please forgive me.
and then pray for one another and then pray for the Holy Spirit. I give you about five minutes. Don't pray long. Start from Adam and go to Revelation, theological prayers, da, 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 da. oh Lord, da, da, da. you know. Don't do that. You don't impress God with sophisticated prayers. You impress God when you are humble. Okay? So let's pray in groups and then I'm going to have a closing prayer. Amen. Father in heaven, what a privilege to come in your presence. What a privilege to pray and to know that you know our hearts and you love us and you want to answer better than we think to ask. Father, we acknowledge that we don't deserve it. We cannot do it. We need you. We desperately need you. And in honest humility, we ask forgiveness. We ask that you forgive us for our love for self, for our lack of faith, for our uh, uh, doubt to trust in you. And Father, we pray that you help us to daily surrender and we pray, Father, that you would fill us with your Spirit. You promised to give your Holy Spirit, and we need your Holy Spirit. We plead, we pray, we ask that you fill every single person, every single family here, and you fill this church with your Spirit. Father, come with your Spirit and do the things that we cannot do in our power. Help us to forget self and be focused on you. Trust in you, allow you to work according to your plan. Please be with us for the rest of this weekend. And may it all be for your glory. We pray together and we ask this in Jesus' name. And thank you, Lord, for answering. We love you. Amen. See you tomorrow. Thank you so much, Pavel. I love that story about his uh, grandfather. If you knew God, you'd be singing too. <laughs> what a beautiful picture, you know, in my own life. Surrender comes when I fall in love with somebody. Um, I've shared these stories with you, but uh, whether it's a car, whether it's something else, you know, when getting married to somebody, uh, it's, a, it's love that compels, that changes us. Paul wrote, it's the love of Christ that compels us. We judge thus that if one died for all, then all died and he died for us, that we should no longer live for ourselves, but for the one who died for us. It's the love of Christ that compels us. God bless you. Thanks for coming tonight. Thank you for your time. May you know him, and may you sing because you know him. Have a wonderful, wonderful evening. God bless you.